past few weeks, we've been journeying with Jesus towards Jerusalem and listening in as he delivers his final messages and teachings to his disciples and the crowd that always seems to be following him. Some of these lessons have come in the form of parables, a story that can have multiple meanings depending on the perspective from which you enter it, which character you identify with, what sticks out to you on a particular day that you hear it. But one thing is universally true about parables, they have a twist. Last week we heard the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee was well-educated and pious and obedient to God, but also righteous and arrogant. The tax collector was not as well-educated and by his own admission, not particularly pious or obedient, yet God is more excited about the presence and prayer of the tax collector than the Pharisee. That's the twist. Our guest preacher, Reverend Stephanie, Dr. Stephanie Buchanan Crowder, challenged us to reflect in what ways we might identify with the tax collector or behave like the Pharisee. This week, the lectionary invites us to consider another story involving Jesus, a tax collector, and a crowd. And although the Gospel of Luke presents this as a pit stop during Jesus' travels rather than a parable, there's still clearly a message that the Gospel writer wants our community and his to take from this incident. Now, at first glance, it might be easy to conclude that the point is God favors tax collectors. <laughs> that would certainly be a twist and an interesting bit of career guidance. And in fact, though, if that's the only insight, the only takeaway that you have, it's not all bad. Because tax collectors, back in the time that this gospel was written, were about as unpopular and unworthy as one could be. The tax collectors referred to in the New Testament were local Judeans employed in tax farming. They were employed directly by the Roman government to extract taxes, customs, tools on land, products, and persons. And in this system, the authorities received their money up front, and the tax farmer charged commissions on what he had collected. So it's not hard to see how such an arrangement would be ripe for extortion and graft. Because of their positions as agents of Rome and their exploitation of their own people, tax collectors were socially rejected, religiously excommunicated, and viewed as political traitors. So if God loves even the tax collectors, then clearly God's love is available to everyone. And that is indeed good news, a message worth remembering and sharing. But I would like to invite us to briefly dig a bit deeper to see what else the Gospel writer might want us to know, to think about, to do. But first I need to call your attention to a familiar story that Luke places between these two tax collector tales. <coughs> It's called The Rich Official, and this is the version from the Message Bible. It's actually Luke 18, 18 through 25. One day, one of the local officials asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to deserve eternal life? Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandments, don't you? No illicit sex, no killing, no stealing, no lying. Honor your mother and father. He said, I've kept them all for as long as I can remember. When Jesus heard that, he said, then there's only one thing left to do. Sell everything you own and give it away to the poor. You will have riches in heaven. Then come follow me. Well, this was the last thing the official expected to hear. He was very rich and became terribly sad. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let them go. Seeing his reaction, Jesus said, Do you have any 
any idea how difficult it is for people who have it all to enter God's kingdom? I'd say it's easier to thread a camel through a needle's eye than get a rich person into God's kingdom. So in summary, this rich man gets the answer to his question, but his investment in his possessions prevent him from accepting the opportunity that Jesus is offering him. He chooses the perceived control and certainty of his comfort, self-insured by his own wealth, over caring for those on the margins, the least of these, the poor, the widow, the children, the elderly, the immigrant, the homeless, the addicted, the mentally ill. Apparently, eternal life, whatever that means to him, is the one thing he cannot buy. And so he goes away, very rich, but terribly sad. I mentioned that this story is likely familiar because even if you have not heard this specific translation, I'm sure you've heard the theme that God not only favors the poor versus the rich, but in fact that God's feelings about the rich are similar to people's feelings about tax collectors. They exploit the poor, enjoy benefits they don't deserve, bully or ignore those they perceive as weak or who simply disagree with them. In the Gospel of Luke in particular, it's repeatedly pointed out that wealth can easily become a pursuit that displaces the priority of serving God and therefore excludes the rich from the opportunity to experience God's grace. Those who are wealthy, in power, have status or privilege, often find it difficult to develop fulfilling relationships with God because their desire to maintain their wealth, power, status, or privilege seduces them into rejecting their own intangible needs for authentic, unconditional love for healthy relationships and community, for spiritual contentment. Which brings us back to our friend Zacchaeus, who is both rich and a tax collector. He is part of a political and economic system that strategically advantages the elites like him. And yet, he is willing to risk scorn and embarrassment to leave the comfort of his home join into a crowd of people who are vocal in their dislike and disapproval of him and climb up into an uncomfortable tree just for the opportunity to get a glimpse of the prophet Jesus that he's heard so much about. What might Zacchaeus have wanted to see Jesus so much that he was willing to sacrifice his dignity? What might each of us be willing to risk for such an encounter? For Zacchaeus, the reward was certainly worth the risk, much to the surprise of the crowd and probably to him as well. Because not only did he get to see Jesus, but Jesus sees him and calls him by name. Jesus knows who he is, what he does for a living, what others think of him, and still, Jesus calls out to him. And in fact, Jesus goes a step further by offering Zacchaeus the opportunity for a very close encounter by inviting himself to Zacchaeus' house. There was both an intentionality and an urgency in Jesus' summons as he makes his way to Jerusalem, his final destination. Throughout Luke's Gospel, Jesus sides with those on the margin, those considered down and out, not accounted for much in the eyes of the world. And while Zacchaeus is rich, he is nevertheless despised by his neighbors, counted as nothing, perhaps even as worse than nothing. Though the crowds of Jericho may not have known who Zacchaeus truly is, and though Zacchaeus may have even wondered himself, Jesus sees distinctly the face of his family, God's family. And by seeing him, calling him, staying with him, blessing him, Jesus declares for all to hear 
that this one, even this chief tax collector, is a child of Abraham, a child of God. Zacchaeus, as we saw, is overjoyed by Jesus' extension of mercy in the form of table fellowship. His insistence that Zacchaeus allow him to host him as a, as a house guest. And when the crowd begins to grumble about the unworthiness of Jesus' choice, Zacchaeus responds by publicly announcing a choice of his own, one that is significantly different than the choice made by the rich official. Zacchaeus joyfully and wholeheartedly responds to God's radical grace by promising to give away half of his money to the poor and make lavish restitution where needed. And although Zacchaeus' pronouncement is provoked by the angry taunts of the crowd, he has correctly perceived that Jesus is interested in more from him than just hospitality. Zacchaeus may have been wanting to call attention to the fact that he's actually already committed to living as an observant Jew, caring for the widow and the orphan, despite what his neighbors may think of him. Or he may have heard through the grapevine that Jesus was preaching a message of redistribution of wealth as a prerequisite for eternal life, and he wants to preempt Jesus' challenge by doing exactly that. But regardless of why Zacchaeus does it, the twist in this story is that the outcast is the observant one. He is the one who gets it, the message that Jesus has been trying to communicate to his disciples. A message of love that is rooted in the imperative of social and economic justice for those on the margins. A message that will eventually lead to Jesus' execution as an enemy of the empire. His mission was to shake up the status quo, to comfort the afflicted, and afflict the comfortable. So where would we find ourselves in the crowd surrounding Jesus? Pushing and shoving, taking a risk to get closer, hoping to be noticed? Or standing on the fringes, sensing that something important is happening but not really sure what it means. Present, but cautious about getting too involved. How might we respond to a close encounter with Jesus, to the presence of God's grace in our lives? There's no right or wrong answers to those questions. They are truly meant for personal reflection, and each of us will likely have a different answer depending on where we are on our individual journey and what we're longing to find. The good news and the joy of the good news is that God is seeking us and that God's love has a way of finding us if we let it. Whether we're up in the branches of a tree, down under the ground, or hiding under the bed whether we think we're worthy or not, and whether others think we're worthy or not. The choice is ours. Let us be willing to risk seeing and being seen by God. As Jesus said to Zacchaeus, we, you and me, we're part of God's family, beloved children of God. May the power and transformative love of God's grace bring you great joy and inspire you to be the change that the world so desperately needs right now. Amen.